This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. The question that everybody's asking and has been asking for a while now is what is happening? What is going on in America and around the world? And what is happening next? What is going to happen next? We're going to talk about that and other things on this program. And we're going to open some doors that you probably haven't. Uh, walked through before. The first thing I want to say, and it's something that I've said earlier on the program, the Paul McGuire Report, is this. And this is a statement that you have heard, I'm sure, many times during your life, but I'm going to repeat it to you now because it, it is a key in understanding the answers to those questions. The old expression goes that those who don't understand what's happening, basically it's because they didn't learn the lessons of history. That people who forget history, people who don't learn the lessons of history, are going to repeat those mistakes over and over again. Now, this is not a hard thing to grasp because it has been told to us countless times that those who don't remember history are failed to re- are are destined to repeat it again and the problem is in the United States of America European Union and in most nations in the world we have and I don't mean this to be disparaging to anybody but we have a mass dumbed down populace a global indoctrinated population who who not only can't remember history, they have never really been taught history. History and the lessons of history, especially in the last 50 years, have been deliberately concealed from hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. And that includes of course, the United States of America. Why is that? Because when we talk about history, and you think you know something about history, and perhaps I think I know something about history, and on and on, the reality is what we think we know about history is basically determined by movies, television, books, uh, school, uh, and things of that nature. Now, if all you have been exposed to in your life is various forms of propaganda and indoctrination, then even if you could remember history, it wouldn't do you any good because you never learned the truth about history. And it's the truth about history that becomes the lesson that can save your life in the present and the near future and the far off future. So when people throw out that question, what's going to happen next? Why did this happen? What's happening now? What's going to happen next? If you understood history, if you invested any minimal time at all in in learning true history and gaining real knowledge, the doors of understanding in your life would fly wide open and you wouldn't have to stumble around like some bozo in the dark looking for their flashlight. And when they find their flashlight, it doesn't do any good because the batteries are dead. Believe me, I know. (laughs) In my house, there's been numerous times when the lights went off or whatever, and I had, you know, flashlights strategically placed in different places. But other people in the house borrowed the flashlight. And, of course, the flashlight was no longer in its proper place. And when I finally did find a flashlight, it had no battery. So I turned it on, and, and there was this so little light that you can't see where you're going. Well, that's the same thing with receiving 
effective knowledge, when you, when you have rejected knowledge, which again is talked about in Proverbs constantly, you're rejecting wisdom, you're rejecting truth, you're rejecting power, you're rejecting peace of mind, you're rejecting sanity, you're rejecting prosperity, you're rejecting health, you're rejecting longevity. Okay, so this is really easy to wrap your head around. This is really easy to receive a fast download and have in your consciousness, your mind, your intellect, a very quick understanding of what's happening so that you don't have to join the rest of the ignorant. And again, I'm not putting people down. You don't have to join the masses of ignorant people who have been strategically and methodically dumbed down and who are stumbling around in the dark and cannot either find a flashlight so they can see their way, or if they do happen to find a flashlight, the batteries are dead. Now, I'm not, going, I'm not trying to be unkind. and this is, this is an area I keep visiting. but. I have been saying this publicly because God told me to. No, not in an audible voice, in my inner man, and from meditating and reading the Word of God. And you say, well, how did God tell you to, to, to warn people about these things? Well, you see, that's an easy answer. That's an easy download. If you and the people you know were reading their Bibles, and again, I'm not putting anybody down out there. I'm talking most likely to the people you know. You would not be listening to the Paul McGuire Report if you didn't have an aggressive hunger for the truth. So my assumption is that most of the people listening to this program, you're already connected to the truth because you're connected to programs like this where we present the unvarnished truth and we force you to think. So you're, you're connected. You, you understand what I'm talking about. But the people we know, the people that God has called us to influence, are stumbling around in the dark, and they're, great, they're in great danger. Okay, so a person can challenge you and say, what do you mean God told you to warn people about stuff like this? Well, he did. And then people may challenge you. That's fine. Challenge me. Read the Word of God. Read the account of the watchman in the Old Testament. And the watchman in the Old Testament was called by God to get up into a watchtower, an elevated platform from which he could see miles and miles and miles into the distance. His assignment was to keep his eyes open, not fall asleep. And if he sees the enemy of God's people coming at God's people from the distance, the watchman was commanded by God to blow the shofar, the trumpet of warning, so that the children of Israel would rouse themselves, fortify their encampment, and when the enemy tried to come down upon them, They were able to protect themselves and survive. But if the watchman was unfaithful, which means he either fell asleep or he wasn't paying attention and didn't see the enemy coming, or he did not blow the shofar or the trumpet to rouse God's people, then God said to the watchman, if you fail, if you fail to warn my people of the danger that's coming, I am going to hold the blood of my people to your account. In other words, watchmen, you are accountable for not warning my people. When I put you in a position to warn them, and you failed to warn them, and there was a great slaughter, the Lord said to the watchman, I'm going to hold the blood of my people. You will be accountable for the blood of my people. And then God also said to the watchman, Uh, If you are faithful, and you're alert, and you see the enemy coming from the distance, and you blow the trumpet of warning, 
then my people will be roused, they'll be prepared, they will defend themselves successfully from the enemy's attack. And that's what God really wants. But then there's the other option when the watchman's faithful, sees the enemy coming, he blows the shofar or the trumpet, but God's people ignore the warning of the watchman. God's leaders ignore the warning of the watchman, and the people of God are slaughtered. Then God says, I'm not going to hold you responsible, watchman, for what happened. The blood of the people is on their own hands. The blood of the people is in the hands and on the hands of the leaders who ignored uh, the warning and failed to react. Now, that, that situation, that paradigm, happens over and over again in history. And, and you say, well, I'm not a watchman. Hey, wake up. Everyone is a watchman to one degree or another. And everybody has given a plat has been given a platform uh, from God to one degree or another. Or if you yourself are not a watchman, but then God expects you to partner with people who are watchmen and watchmen ministries and pray for them, and stand with them to warn the people in a time of danger so that slaughter can be averted. Now, this is, this is critical, and yet, when you see the statistical percentages regarding evangelical churches, you see very few faith, faithful watchmen. Uh, very few. Very few blowing the trumpet. Most don't even have any idea what's happening. Because, to put it bluntly, whether they're fully aware of it or not, they're in rebellion from God. They're in rebellion from God because God says this in Proverbs written by King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. I, again, I'm just going to read you a couple of verses. It applies to every person who is a child of God. The Proverbs, this is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. Excuse me, verse 2. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, equity to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning. Now, that means even a man or a woman that, that is wise, that, that is intelligent, they are, are in just, they have just as much need for wisdom and knowledge as the simple person. Because our, our standard, our comparison, is not our fellow human beings. It's, it's God Almighty who is omniscient, all-knowing. And that's why it says a wise man or a wise woman will hear and increase learning. Remember the parable of the talents in the, in, in the New Testament? We're essentially in that parable. It's Jesus that is going away. And he gives his servants uh, a various amount, a different amount of talents, and says he's going away. And then he comes back, and then, then there is a accountability. God, of course, expects them to be fruitful and multiply, to multiply the talents that he gave each one. And when he comes back, his servants. Um, managed to to multiply to different percentages what he gave them. And the ones that multiplied what he gave them, uh, they were praised by Jesus in the parable. So when we read this here, um, a man or a woman of understanding will attain wise counsel 
to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What God is saying to you now and to me now and to all of his children now is that we are commanded by God to increase and seek after wisdom, knowledge, and guidance. It's not something like, you know, feel like it or not. In the same way that when uh, in that parable where Jesus goes away and he gives a different amount of talents to his servants, he expects multiplication when he comes back. This is a primary law in the Word of God that begins in Genesis, where God says repeatedly to Adam and Eve and to future generations, Noah and his generation, after the flood, God says the same thing. He says to Adam and Eve, Noah and others, be fruitful and multiply, be fruitful and multiply. And God is not just talking about sexual reproduction, although that's the number one area of his concern. But it, but God is saying regarding everything he gives you and me, every talent, every ability, every asset, every resource, how much money you have, what your level of gifting is, what your level of talent and ability is, God expects you to be fruitful and multiply it. Multiply it. It's never about stagnation. Stagnation is disobedience. Stagnation uh, due to fear is sin. Stagnation, a lack of being fruitful and multiplying due to, due to, to fear is a sin. Why? Because God's kingdom and you and I are citizens. You and I belong to the kingdom of God. If Assuming that you and I are born again, assuming that, that we have uh, asked to be cleansed of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, assuming that we've invited Christ into our lives and we've asked Christ to make us born again, if we've done that, then we are in the kingdom of God, and we are supposed to be obedient to God and fulfill his commandments, such as being fruitful and multiplying. So, let's just look quickly at Matthew twenty-five, fourteen to 30, known as the parable of the talents. And this is what I was just referring to. In starting at verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven, you and I are in the kingdom of heaven, is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them, his assets, something that he expects fruitfulness and multiplication from. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another, one, to each according to his ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So we see that this uh, manager or man is going away on a far journey, and he's distributing among his servants a, a different numerical amount of talents to each one. Okay? And he expects multiplication. So, picking up on verse 16, Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled with them. Okay, let's look at this. Let's, let's not look at this through our evangelical sunglass eyes. 
We're not wearing evangelical sunglasses. That's not reality. That's a distorted reality. A distorted reality is a lie. We don't look at reality through the lens of a lie. We look at reality through the lens of a biblical worldview. What is a biblical worldview? It's a lens of perception that is based on the Word of God. You get a hold of that and you will fly, baby. You will fly. Okay. So, notice that each of the servants, according to their own abilities, uh, had a different amount of fruitfulness and multiplication. And uh, the manager, which represents Jesus, praised them for their multiplication. But notice this. It says, but he, one of the uh, servants, but he who received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Here's the servant who gets the smallest amount of talents. Why? Because, because the manager or Jesus was distributing the talents based on their ability. So, so this servant only had one talent, okay? And what did he do with it? I'll, I'll read it again. But he who received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Why, why do you think that this servant hid his Lord's money? Well, no, the answer is fear. Fear. Fear was the controlling mechanism in the servant who only received one talent. And because he was dominated by fear and not controlled by the Spirit of God, which operates kingdom principles based on faith, but because he chose to operate based on fear, he, he behaved like somebody dominated by fear, and in an insecure, frightened manner, he hid his Lord's money in a little hole that he dug, like a rabbit, like a little, little rabbit. Okay? Christians act like little, little rabbits all the time. Let's pick up at verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents. That's a lot of multiplication. His Lord said to him, and this is what you and I want to hear, right? This, make no mistake about it. You want to hear these words. I want to hear these words. So the servant that received five talents made another five talents, and the Lord said to him, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler. Notice the word is ruler. Don't apologize for it. Don't be afraid of it. The word is ruler. Because this servant was faithful to multiply the talents that his Lord had given him, the Lord praised this faithful servant and said, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Wow! I'm talking about this is, this is like, you, you should be flying. If you were to grasp the, the, the fullness of, the power, the joy of the truth that is contained in, in this truthful message from Jesus Christ, it would liberate you in so many levels and areas of your life, you, you wouldn't know what hit you. Instead of crawling around and, and weeping and crying all day long, you would be rocking and rolling. Now, maybe that upsets you. You don't want to rock and roll. Okay, I'll, I'll think of a better word. You could Beethoven yourself into bliss. 
your classic, if you prefer classical music, then Beethoven yourself into bliss. Now, look what else, and, and then, and then, of course, the Lord makes him ruler over many things, and then fills his life with supernatural joy. A lot of Christians miss this when they read the Bible. Not only was the faithful servants given joy, and they were made ruler over many things, but joy, joy, and it's the joy of the Lord that, that, that's our strength. You say, well, what does that mean to me? Everything, emotional distress, fear, depression, anxiety, confusion, torment, oppression, all the bondages that, that can come upon us in this fallen world that imprison us and torment us. The Lord, if you're here, the Lord is saying to you and me, if we're faithful in the multiplication, of the talents or assets that God has given us, he will not only make us ruler, which implies promotion and favor, but he will give us supernatural joy. And that supernatural joy, which produces strength and healing and victory and releases us from bondage, it releases us from depression, it releases you from anxiety. It releases you from that sense of, uh, you know, foreboding spirits. It releases you from that sense of oppression. And the time for it is now. One word from the Lord, one decree from the Lord, like now, spoken to you, spoken to me, and we're set free and filled with his joy. Then let's keep reading. Verse 22. He, all, he also had received two talents. Now we're talking about another servant who received two talents. And said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So there's a repetition, a, a teaching. The Lord is using repetition. The Lord is teaching. The Lord is praising his faithful servant. Why? Because his faithful servant is entering into kingdom principles, just like right now the Holy Spirit is trying to get you and me to enter into kingdom principles. And that means you, you are able to do what God wants you to do, which is to be fruitful and multiply, to, fruit, to be fruitful and multiply. So this faithful servant receives praise from the Lord, who says to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler. Again, we're not afraid of the word ruler over many things. And once again, enter into the joy of your Lord. See, this is not just about money. This is not just about material assets, although it includes that. This is not just about talents and abilities, although it includes that. This is also about the fact that when you operate according to kingdom principles and you do what God tells you to do, that the Lord will make it possible for you to enter into the joy of the Lord. But it doesn't stop there. When you enter into the joy of the Lord, that also means that the anointing of God, the healing of God, the deliverance of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding and guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, Anxiety goes, depression goes, the huge psychological problems and uh, complexities that, that, that can be so heavily upon us, they dissipate as we receive the joy of the Lord, which comes from 
being fruitful and multiplying. There's a lot in that package that the Lord wants to give you. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. Notice the key word from the uh, unfaithful servant. And I was afraid. So, see, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors here. The unfaithful servant who only got one talent is blowing smoke in the eyes of the Lord. He or she who got one talent is is tap dancing in front of the Lord. And, And they're not being honest. They're actually, when you get right down to it, the, the servant who received one talent is actually has the audacity and is accusing the Lord of being a selfish, hard, unfair ruler and accusing him of stealing. No, no, that's what it actually says. When, when the unfaithful servant says, uh, Accuse the Lord of reaping where you have not sown means you're you're taking use you're stealing. This this servant has the audacity of accusing the Lord of stealing and and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Again, stealing. But you see, there's a very ironical principle here that I, that I've observed in human nature early, early, early when I was called into the ministry. And you notice behavior patterns in Christians and non-Christians as you're growing in the Lord and as a brand new babe in the Lord. But I was also ministering to 5,000 people a week uh, from the Lambs Club as the host and producer and uh, on stage, not stage, on, on the platform of contemporary Christian music concerts in Broadway and Times Square. And, and I would notice, I noticed patterns in Christians and, and how they would manifest certain antagonistic bitterness, anger, resentment, jealousy, fear, behavior patterns that came out of nowhere. I mean, I would notice that people who were literally a walking revival when I first got to this ministry, there was this one guy who was extremely loving, kind, encouraging, and been walking with the Lord, or turned his life over to the Lord, probably for seven years. I was brand new in the Lord, but his positive glowing face, his his encouraging words. Guy was a blessing. And then after about a year or two, he was one of the key people in this ministry, but after a year or two, I began to notice this incredible amount of bitterness that was coming out of his personality. Tremendous amount of anger, hatred, resentment. And you know, you don't have to be Albert Einstein, to figure out that there's something going on in a person's life. But the key thing that I began to learn, because I began to see this same dynamic happen in people over and over again, is many times when when you surrender to fear, or any number of sins, fear, resentment, bitterness, or you feel like you've been hurt, by higher up leadership or another person, you feel like you have been ignored, you feel like you nobody cares. What happens is like you open your life to bondage and like resentment and bitterness and anger begins to to develop a satanic stronghold in your personality. That's what the Lord is identifying. You see, this guy who's accusing the Lord of stealing, if you look at it, the root of all the the problems of the unfaithful servant who dug a little hole in the ground and buried his one talent, 
was that he was afraid. You see, because he stopped operating in faith, and because he opened his heart and mind and soul to fear, because he allowed fear to, to take up a resonance in his heart, that corrupted him. And that happened so many times. And he was unable to be fruitful and multiply because he opened the door to fear and allowed fear and the spirit of fear to dominate him. Now, I'm not saying Christians can be demon-possessed, but they certainly can be externally demon-oppressed. The theological term for that is demonization. Demonization is when a Christian is not possessed internally by a demon, but when a Christian or a group of Christians are oppressed externally, and that is called demonization. I believe that's what happened to the unfaithful servant here. So the, this is how the Lord responded to this unfaithful servant who did not, who was not faithful, did not, uh, did not multiply what he was given. And he was afraid. But his Lord answered and said to him, they didn't, Notice that the Lord didn't baby him. The Lord answered him and said, quote, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. See, he was exposing the, the lie and the deceit that the unfaithful servant was spewing out of his mouth. So then the Lord says, So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So what he was saying is, your, your smoke and mirrors lie about me being dishonest, and why you couldn't multiply the talent that I gave you, the Lord exposed it and said, look, cut the baloney, the least you could have done, the least you could have done if you really were afraid, is that you could have invested or deposited my money, which I gave you, with the bankers. The idea being, we all know that putting your money in the bank can be relatively safe, but you're not going to have a huge interest return. But it will be relatively safe. So the Lord said, you could have done something. At least you would have multiplied something. So then the Lord said, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Why did the, why did the Lord say that? Because when we, when we are operating in kingdom laws of being fruitful, and multiplying, the person who was able to be fruitful and multiply at the greatest percentage, more will be given to him or her. Not less, more. So the Lord says, take the one talent from him and give it to him, the, the one who is the most faithful, who has ten talents. Because the one who is the most faithful, the Lord's going to invest in, because that person is the one that's going to multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. And then, starting up in verse 29, For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. See, God's trying to get us to see in our minds the laws and operating principles of the kingdom of God. And he wants us, what this is really all about, is God is trying to teach us how to enter into the operating principles of the kingdom of God. God is trying to teach you now and me now how to be fruitful and to multiply what he has given us. And this is a massive principle that when you get a hold of it, you release the kingdom of God 
into your circumstance, and the miraculous happens. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now, now look at, these are very strong words from the Lord. If you don't really understand what the Lord is talking about, you could come up with a misinterpretation of God's word, and you could actually be tempted to think that God was cruel and mean. Because look at what the Lord says. Um, For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That should be very sobering to you and I. Cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What the Lord is talking about here is that he's teaching us that every one of us, you, me, every believer, is accountable before Jesus, for what Jesus has given us. We are accountable to be fruitful and multiply whatever amount of talents the Lord has given us. But if we choose to be unprofitable, if we choose to be a servant who does not multiply or is not fruitful with what the Lord has given us, then we are in danger of being cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a truth that's, that is a liberating truth, but it's a very sobering truth. And it's a truth that evangelical Christians never, just about never teach on. Because what this is talking about is what's called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we're not talking about the great right throne of judgment, but the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is where every believer, where every person who is saved will go to to be judged by Christ, even though we're guaranteed entrance into heaven because we're saved. We are still accountable and we're evaluated by Jesus Christ in a manner similar. Uh, to the master who goes away and gives a different amount of talents to his servants. And at the judgment, Jesus, of Je- at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, Jesus uh, examines every believer and basically says, you know, have you been faithful with what I've given you? Have you been fruitful and, and multiplied what I've given you? And if you have, then there's tremendous rewards given out at the judgment seat of Christ. And if you haven't been, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It, it, you'll still get into heaven, but it'll be, you will go through some kind of purifying fire that the Bible says is similar to a man in a house that's burning down. The house represents his life. And the house, your, your own house is burning down all around you because the flames are the purifying flames of God burning up all the baloney in your life. But you'll escape. Okay, at the, at the last second, your house will collapse. It'll be burned to the ground. But you will escape and enter into the kingdom of God. But the reason the Lord uses such strong words is he's trying to instill in each one of us a deep understanding of our accountability to multiply and be fruitful with what the Lord has given us. And the key here is not to frighten us. The key here is to set us free. So the takeaway from this is that 
you and I have a choice. Every one of us have been given talents and abilities. God expects us to multiply them. And God expects us to learn how to operate according to kingdom of God principles. And but if we choose not to do that, and if we if we choose to be uh, constrained and dominated by fear, a spirit of fear, if we make the mental choice, the choice of our will, to open ourselves up to fear and not faith, and because we have chosen to accept fear as our ruler, then we can't be fruitful, we can't be multiplied. And, and Jesus is going to judge us at the judgment seat of Christ. Once again, we'll get into heaven, but we will not have been fruitful. We, we didn't faithfully multiply the talent that he gave us. Now, what do we all want to hear? When we enter into the kingdom of heaven in our brand new glorified body, what do we, what do we desire to hear? Well, it says it here in this passage. The Lord says uh, to the faithful servants, and you and I will stand before Jesus in heaven, and we want to all hear the same words from the Lord, which is, quote, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So there is so much truth in these words. There's so much truth that it, that it is absolutely amazing. If we're faithful to, fruitful, to be fruitful and to multiply, then God says that will allow us to become rulers over many things. You see, so we're rewarded for our faithfulness. God allows us to be rulers over many things. He, he promotes us, and that promotion begins here on earth. And then when we get into the kingdom of heaven, when we get into heaven, it continues on. The believers who were faithful on earth will receive promotion. They will become rulers starting here on earth, and then you will rule over even more things in heaven. And this is a concept not understood by the evangelical church, hardly at all. But this whole idea that you can be a backslidden Christian, dominated by fear, unfaithful to be fruitful and multiply in anything, you, you don't do what the Lord told you to do. You don't participate in soul winning or making disciples of all nations, etc., etc. And there's, no, there's this notion in, in the Christian church in America, especially, that you can be guilty of all that disobedience and that somehow you're just going to stroll into heaven born again and you're going to receive the same amount of rewards as the believer or believers who were faithful to multiply what the Lord had given them. No, see, that's a lie. That's a mythology that Christians embrace, that, that every Christian is just going to, because they're saved, they're going to get into heaven and their, their rewards will be equal. It's not going to work that way. God is going to, to differentiate between those of his people who were faithful and multiplied the talents he gave them versus his unfaithful servants, who were dominated by fear and did nothing. They're saved, but you see, they don't get into heaven and start from the same place. One person brings with themselves, he or she, when they get into heaven, they bring all the things they did that they truly did for Jesus in terms of multiplication, they bring that with them. And so, immediately upon entering the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says to them, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
you have been faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of, of your Lord. So that person goes into heaven and gets more responsibility, a higher level of rulership, and and is rewarded both in this lifetime and for eternity for their faithfulness. We don't all get into heaven and, and get the same reward. Now, once you get into heaven, I believe that if you determine you can grow in heaven, uh, but the person who was faithful on earth starts out in heaven at a far uh, higher level, given far, more, far many more responsibilities from the Lord Jesus Christ. So you and I want to pay close attention to how the kingdom of God really operates and operate within the principles of the kingdom of God, which God's expectation is that we are to be fruitful and to multiply. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. We'll be back in a moment. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Powerful liberation for you and me and anyone if we operate in accordance with the principles of the kingdom of God. And being fruitful and multiplying is key. That's what this ministry is all about. Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church. God calls us, God called me to reach people for Jesus Christ. And I specifically asked him, Lord, I want to reach the people that are the most turned off, the most hostile, and to the people that seem to reject Jesus the most. Those are the people that I would like to win, Lord, for your kingdom. I I want the tough cases, Lord. I prayed that prayer for years. And the Lord uh, called me to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to use media, television, film, books, articles, speaking, conferences. And, you know, I just began to do what the Lord told me to do. And as I stepped out on faith with those baby steps of faith, just like you can, um, the Lord will, will give you favor. The Lord will multiply. And you will be amazed at, at what the Lord can do through you if you make yourself available in faith. But the, the key thing to understand here is that none of us want to be like the unfaithful servant in the Bible. If you don't do anything for the Lord Jesus, if you are not being fruitful and not multiplying, then you are what you're doing is you're allowing fear to dominate you. And if you allow fear to dominate you, you're not going to be fruitful. You're not going to multiply. You'll be dominated by fear. And fear is a weapon of the devil. So we have to be very careful that we don't allow a spirit of fear to become entrenched in our lives. And we need to remember that fear is not just a psychological mechanism. Fear is not just an emotional mechanism. But according to the Bible, fear is an actual spirit. The Bible refers to a spirit of fear. And a spirit of fear is is a demon of fear. And we have to remember that we have a call from God to be fruitful and to multiply. But in the process of being fruitful and multiplying, we are sooner gonna, sooner or later, and it's going to be sooner rather than later, we will enter into 
various forms of spiritual warfare, which is warfare on a multi-dimensional level. And by that, I mean it's warfare uh, that is in the physical realm, the mental, psychological realm, the, the cultural realm. Uh, also, it's warfare in the spiritual world or unseen world where the Apostle Paul teaches us in Ephesians 6, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers and the dark, unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And Paul is warning us that when we are faithful to, to fruit, be fruitful and multiply, to win people to Jesus Christ, we are going to have to enter into spiritual warfare against a hierarchy of demonic powers, not people, but principalities and powers and the dark unseen forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we have to use our spiritual weapons to conquer those spiritual forces, and one of those spiritual forces is a spirit of fear, which we conquer by renewing our minds with the Word of God and developing by faith the mind of Christ, where we uh, learn how to engage in prayer warfare, where we learn how to fight a spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. Because, again, God has called us to be fruitful and, and multiply. And that means being victorious in kingdom business. And what is kingdom business? It's saving souls, making disciples of all nations, uh, teaching people a biblical worldview. And this is critical in the time period that we're in. Because uh, in, in my latest book, which has a title, which the title says this, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. And that's where we are now. We are in a prophetic time zone. We are in the last days. And the reason I wrote The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World was to teach people a biblical worldview where people can look at the reality of what's happening all around you now and understand why it's happening from history, from the lessons of history, the, the lessons of the Word of God. And in the book, I open up what it means to have this greatest battle which is going on in the hearts and minds of mankind. That's what's happening right now. I was just doing research. I do a lot of research, reading an entire spectrum of diverse material from science to physics to psychology to neuropsychiatry to Old Testament, New Testament, prophecy, book of Revelation, and on and on and on. And I keep hearing this repeated from secular authors, researchers, and scientists, and, and that is the statement that the human race, the people of planet Earth, have never been in such a global conflict as they are now. We are collectively, as the human race, in uncharted territory. But I want to say something. Every one of us has been called by God and this is part of being fruitful and multiplying. This is part of doing what God has called us to do. Every one of us has been called by God to be fruitful and multiply. That means when you're fruitful and multiplying, you're growing from whatever seeds you've planted. And that could be seeds of knowledge, seeds of wisdom, seeds of understanding. And, and we hear constantly the words, well, what's going to happen next in America? What's going to happen next in the world? 
But I just want to say something to you. Not only do we need to know what's going to happen next, but we need to understand what happened in the past. That's history. Those that don't learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. See, history provides lessons as to what happens to us if we depart from God's ways and what happens to us if we make this choice or that choice. History shows us quite clearly the results of different actions and different beliefs, and it teaches us lessons. But if we either don't know history or we fail to heed the lessons of history, then we are going to repeat it. And that means because we are disobeying God by not gaining knowledge and and wisdom, not understanding history, both in the Bible and from other truthful sources, we are going to be destined to repeat the lessons that history has taught us, which means we're going to walk into a curse. You know, God used the Old Testament and the New Testament um, in countless historical accounts of the children of Israel and what happened when the children of Israel followed idols and all these different historical battles in the Old Testament It's a whole historical record of lessons from history in the Word of God designed to to protect God's people from being cursed. And if, if we will, by faith, learn those lessons, trust God, and follow God's precepts and advice and counsel, then we can be blessed and not walk under a curse. So, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world is the 34th book I've written in my life. I'm working on one now. Um, And I would consider it, at least up to this point, the most important book that I've written in my life. Because this book is 374 pages. Originally, I had 4,000 pages. Uh, You know, it was obviously way too long. And I got it down lean and mean to 374 pages because I wanted to capture the most important lessons from history and teach history in a fast, fast moving way that is entertaining, that is gripping that will blow your mind, educate you, and give you the wisdom from the ages that I believe God wants his people to have. So I believe that God called me to write this book as he has called me to write all of my books. God called me to write, among other things. And so I encourage you to get this, because not everybody has the luxury of spending time researching. And in the research, I'm, I'm going to show you in this book uh, the lessons of history. And you see, if you understand history, which most people don't because nobody's bothered to teach them the truth regarding history. Their pastors aren't. If you understand history, then you will understand. You'll be surprised. In fact, you won't be surprised. You'll be amazed. You won't have to ask the question. What's going to happen next? How did we get here? But, but the big question now is, what's going to happen next to America and the world? If you understand history, if you understand what happened in the past, if you understand what, what were the things that brought us to the place that we're now in, then you will easily understand, after reading my book, Greatest Battle, you'll easily understand what is going to happen next. Uh, And I want to say something to you. We all have mental blocks. We all have mental barriers. And one of the biggest mental barriers or mental blocks there is, which is what the Bible calls a stronghold, 
and a stronghold is a satanically energized argument against us. One of the biggest mental blocks we all have as mortal human beings is <clears throat> we, we hide, we try to hide from the truth. Because sometimes it's just too heavy for us to wrap our heads around. And in this book, I expose, in The Greatest Battle, I expose the overarching, biblically-based message about the greatest conflict that exists in The Greatest Battle. And that's the greatest conflict between God, the biblical God, and Lucifer, or Satan, the fallen angel, who is leading a rebellion against God with one-third of the angels, known as the fallen angels. And this great cataclysmic spiritual battle between God and God's angels and God's people versus Satan or Lucifer and the demons and fallen angels and the people who are the servants of Satan and Lucifer are involved in an all-out spiritual war at the end of the age, which is why I titled the book The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. Now, that what I'm trying to teach people in the book is that this great battle between God and Satan it plays out in the physical world around us, but the primary battlefield where this battle is raging right now, the primary battlefield exists in the hearts, minds, brains, consciousness of children, adults, men and women all over planet Earth. In other words, what I'm trying to explain to you in easy terms that are fast moving is what is the exact nature of this raging battle that occurs primarily inside of our hearts and our minds. Those are the battlefields. Because as you know from reading the Bible, what, what the greatest battle is really all about, and I explain it in the book also, what the greatest battle is really all about is not just the fact that it's a battle between the forces of evil, headed up by Satan, and the forces of God, headed up by God, but the purpose of the greatest battle is that it's a battle for who's going to be God. And Satan and the fallen angels, Satan is trying to have a coup to be God, Fallen mankind that have sold their souls to the devil think they're going to be gods with Satan. And then God is God. He's not going to be defeated. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He will not be defeated. He's not going to lose. And so, the most critical thing of all is that this is a battle for souls. I want to say that again. This is a battle for souls. Jesus died on a cross so that every man and woman could be saved if they simply receive Christ's free gift of salvation. So this is a battle for souls. And it is the desire of God to win as many souls as he possibly can and bring them into heaven to live with him in heaven for all eternity. And the devil wants to blind the eyes of people from seeing the truth of God's message of salvation in Jesus Christ, because the devil wants to, to keep as many souls, as many people as he can. He wants to be their God. And the only place he will be their God, according to, to the Bible, is when God wins this great battle over Satan and sends Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, 
the fallen angels, and all those who sold their souls to Satan. When God sentenced them into the lake of fire for all eternity, they will be bound with Satan in, a, in, in what I call, in the book, God's supermax prison, which is the lake of fire. And it's, it's a, the lake of fire is God's supermax prison located in another dimension. And then, completely safe and secured in the dimension of the kingdom of God is heaven. And that's where all of God's people will live. With God, they will live with Jesus in paradise, in the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, in their brand new glorified bodies, and they'll live forever and ever and ever. So that's what this battle is really all about. And that's, that explains what your life is about. Your life is about being fruitful and multiplying using whatever, if God gave you one talent or a million talents. That's about saving souls. It's about reaching people with the gospel and, and saving them and making disciples of all nations and igniting revival and, and bringing about the last day's soul harvest. And God has called you and I to do that. That's the whole purpose of this ministry. We've been called to do that, and we are doing that. We're being faithful. We're multiplying. God has given us a certain amount of talent and abilities, etc., etc., and we're multiplying that by saving souls. And how do we save souls? We win the battle inside of the minds and hearts of people because we deconstruct the lies of Satan and we present effectively the truth of God's word to save souls. But remember, what we just read in Matthew, where we read about the unfaithful servant who was afraid, and because fear dominated them, not faith, they hid the talent that God gave them. And they were not fruitful. They did not multiply because they were dominated by fear. So so I want to encourage you to come with me right now just for a, a minute or two. So let's come before Jesus. Let's go into his throne room and let's ask Jesus to break every vestige of fear that would attempt to come upon us so that you and I and those that we know and love can be released to be fruitful and multiply, to receive that supernatural joy from the Lord. Let's go into the presence of the Lord God right now. So I'm going to pray these words out loud, and if you'd like to, you can pray them out loud with me. And Know that there will be countless numbers of people listening right now at the same time, and they will be praying with us. People who are partners with Paul McGuire Ministries, people who are prayer warriors and uh, contributors to this ministry, people who are our partners, they will be praying with you as we join together. So let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you now. We praise your name, Jesus. Lord, we plead the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, over our lives, and we come boldly now to the throne of grace. Lord, we we tell you from our hearts, we want to be faithful servants, Jesus. We want to be fruitful and multiply, God. We want you to use us to save souls, Lord. We want to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, Lord. So, Lord, we come boldly to the throne of grace through the blood of Jesus, and we ask right now in Jesus' name that the power of God would come upon us with your loving, gentle force, and that right now in the name of Jesus, 
you would shatter <clears throat> and break every stronghold, every thought pattern, every stronghold, and you would banish the, the spirit of fear from attempting to dominate or control our lives. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that the spirit of fear would be broken off every aspect of our lives in the name of Jesus, that the spirit of fear would be purged from our minds in the name of Jesus, that all oppression and that all fear associated with COVID and the related mechanisms would be bound in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you would fill us right now with the dunamis power on high, the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us to overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let the supernatural joy of the Lord materialize and expand and heal and deliver in every aspect of our lives. As your word promises, it will, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We ask that you would fortify us. We ask that you would give us the faith and the boldness to continue on victoriously and to multiply the talents and abilities and gifts that you've given us, Father. Jesus, we pray for our nation, whatever nation we live in. We pray for the people you've called us to minister to. We pray for ourselves and family. And God, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would use us, that you would use each one of us, Lord, to to reach the lost before the return of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, prepare us, God, and anoint us to be prayer warriors. We step out in faith, Father, and we claim this, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And Lord, for any person praying who is suffering from an incredible burden or an incredible affliction, incredible trial, incredible pain or hurt, we all agree right now in Jesus' name that, Lord, you would heal, that you would deliver all those that are suffering from incredible afflictions, God, that you would deliver them and that you would heal them supernaturally. We thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. This is your brother in Christ, Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Make sure you follow, sign in on, get on our e-blast list, and visit all the new, we are expanding, so visit all the new sites and platforms that we're on. Be familiar about them. Uh, by going to paulmcguire.us because we are proactive and we're trying to use wisdom and we don't intend to allow uh, what God has called us to do to be stopped. So if things change, we already have new platforms and new uh, technological uh, vehicles for lack of better better words, to reach people. So God bless you. Keep us in prayer. And remember, Jesus Christ is Lord. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's coming back soon. God bless you, Paul.